Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Hello and welcome everybody. This webinar is being hosted by the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Uh, this presentation is about the situation of Palestinian citizens in Israel. Just by way of explanation and introduction, my name is Bernard Regan. I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. The view of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign is that we are in solidarity with all Palestinians, not just those in the occupied territory of the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza, but the Palestinians in the refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan and elsewhere, and also the Palestinians inside the State of Israel, where due to the legislation that has been enacted by the Israeli government, they are continuing to suffer oppression and discrimination at the hands of that legislation. And everybody who's watching that, this, uh, this seminar will, I'm sure, be aware of the nation state law, which was introduced two years ago by the Israeli government, which further em em embedded the discriminatory attitude of the Israeli state towards its Palestinian citizens. So I think this is an extremely important uh, event, and I hope you're going to gain a lot of information. Our first speaker is Salsan Zaher, who's the Deputy General Director of Adala, the major Palestinian uh, legal rights campaigning organization uh, based in Haifa. I'm very pleased to welcome Sausan. Yeah, thanks Bernard, uh, Bernard, and thank you for the uh, invitation for this important uh, event, important uh, webinar. Uh, I'm happy to be a part of it. Uh, I think like, uh, first of all, I don't uh, think that I have much time uh, to really cover all the issues that are in stake that relate to the Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, which is the uh, focus uh, thing of the work that we do in uh, Adala. Uh, Adala is the legal uh, center for Arab minority rights. This is our formal name. Uh, we are the leading human Palestinian human rights organization uh, inside, we are located inside of Israel in Haifa with an office in the Nakab area in Be'er Sheva. And we have been litigating since 1996 uh, most of the major and landmark cases that relate to the uh, rights of the Palestinian citizens of Israel as well as the rights of Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza. Uh, in cases where uh, violation of uh, international humanitarian law uh, occurred uh, by the Israelis. Um, uh, I think that uh, in order to know what's happening uh, uh, today, uh, we need to have a, a very brief uh, uh, history, historic background. In a nutshell, I will uh, uh, talk about it. Uh, as we all know, uh, after the Nakba, the catastrophe which led to the uh, establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, uh, uh, the Palestinians, most of them 80%, became refugees all over the world. Uh, including as well in Arab neighboring uh, countries and the remaining uh, became 20% of the whole population of what became uh, Israel. Until today, we are 20% between 19 to 20% of the whole population. And uh, what happened after the establishment of the state of Israel is that immediately uh, the laws that were passed during the first uh, Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament, uh, immediately uh, uh, embedded the enemy alien doctrine in the Israeli laws, mainly in issues that are related to citizenship and land. And that was very uh, uh, understandable in terms of logic in the, in the, in the way how the Zionist movement uh, worked, because in order to have the state of Israel, you need land. So basically, they enacted laws that would enable the confiscation of 93% uh, of the land today as well had moved from uh, the Palestinians and now is owned by the uh, state of uh, Israel. Uh, so they have passed several laws that would enable the confiscation. They passed uh, the absentee property law that uh, uh, prohibits the return of Palestinian refugees uh, into uh, uh, Palestine and uh, uh, demand their uh, property, uh, any kind of uh, property, not only houses. Uh, they enabled as well through the property law to confiscate uh, land based on uh, emergency issues or essential issues that are uh, essential for the state of Israel. And in this way, 
uh, uh, we are now in a uh, in, in a way in a in a situation where 93 percent of the land is uh, owned by the state of uh, Israel in different uh, ways. Uh, the second set of laws were the laws of citizenship, uh, because if you have the land to keep the uh, physical existence of the state in terms of having it on a territory, you also need a majority of a Jewish uh, people which basically will hold the Israeli citizenship. And the way that they did it in the early 1950s is that they didn't, they didn't allow for people who were uh, Palestinians, basically, who were defined as enemy in order to gain citizenship. And they did it in several ways. For example, if you were during the war of, on the Nakba, which is November 1947 until May 1948, you were in an a, a enemy uh, a state even for one day, uh, you will not be eligible for citizenship. Uh, even if you were in Nazareth, which is today inside of the Green Line, inside of Israel, uh, but it was annexed to Israel in 1949. So if you were in Nazareth on the, during the, uh, uh, the Nakba War, uh, you also will not be able to gain citizenship. This way it enabled them basically, and we know naturally that's important as well to say that many Palestinians during the war uh, 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 were in the West Bank, were in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria, because you know no one really knew what would happen. So in that way through the citizenship law, uh, thousands and thousands of Palestinians basically uh, were not able to get citizenship and therefore were not able to stay in what became uh, Israel. So these two pillars, which were based on an enemy alien doctrine that viewed the Palestinians as enemy, uh, were the uh, uh, founding pillars of the Israeli laws that also set the relationship between Israel and how they viewed uh, the Palestinians who were able uh, to stay after 1948. And it's, it was important for me to start with these two pillars because until today, we see that the enemy alien doctrine against the Palestinians uh, is still embedded in the laws, uh, the, in the laws, in the policies, in government decisions, uh, until, of course, we get to the uh, Jewish nation state law, which was uh, which passed uh, in July to, uh, 2018. But throughout this period from 1948 until today, uh, we saw a, 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 a racist or institutionalized discrimination uh, system that basically uh, didn't see the Palestinians as equal citizens like, uh, uh, like the Jewish citizens, whether it was in the allocation of property and ownership of land beyond the confiscation issue, whether it was an allocation of budget, uh, whether it's in education and well, welfare in uh, industrial zones and in healthcare, uh, in every ministry that you go over, you would see that there is a huge discrimination and gaps in the allocation of budget. And of course, this affects uh, basic, uh, uh, the implementation and the fulfillment uh, of basic needs, of basic services uh, that are provided in a very different manner and in a huge gap between the Palestinians and the, uh, and the Israelis. Um, uh, so we're talking about, as I said, an institutionalized discriminatory system, but it was also embedded in laws uh, uh, that, uh, in, in the basic laws that were passed by the Israeli Knesset uh, as a constitutional power. And in Israel, you would uh, see that you have laws and you have the basic laws, which have the level of a constitution. They are regarded as the unwritten constitution of Israel. And in 2000 and uh, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, one of the basic laws, which is the basic law Knesset, which sets uh, the political participation, namely the right to vote and the right to be elected, uh, was amended uh, to include a set of criteria of who can be elected to the parliament. And among these uh, criteria were uh, basically, is basically one criteria which until today uh, we view the, uh, we've, we, we try to challenge it every time there is an election for the parliament. And this criteria says that you are not allowed 
to uh, nominate yourself as a party or as an individual if you call for the revocation of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. This means that basically, if you want to call for equality for all citizens, for all the citizens of the state, this means that you are negating the Jewishness, the Jewishness of the state of Israel because it cannot, uh, uh, the, the, like having a Jewish state cannot intertwine with having equality for all the citizens because the fact is that having the definition of Jewish and democratic state, this already means that this so-called democracy is based on ethnic superiority of the Jewish majority uh, inside of Israel. And uh, since 2002 until today, uh, we in Adala uh, uh, need to uh, uh, challenge and go to the Supreme Court every time there is a national election, because every time the Arab political parties or individuals, you know, nominees from the uh, Arab political parties, uh, today we're talking about the joint list, uh, every time there is election, there is a request and demand to disqualify the Arabs. And when you look at the reasons for the disqualification, they basically would range from supporting terrorism, just because they're supporting the Palestinian cause, to revoking, uh, a, a, to revoking the, a, a trying to eliminate the state because they want to call for equality. Uh, the fact that they are supporters or try to support the rights of political prisoners in Israeli prisoners is also an issue that gets out again and again uh, that tries to tackle and attack their support for political prisoners which Israel views basically as terrorists so the argument would follow that these Arabs these MKs or these people who are trying to be elected are supporters of uh, a terrorist again each time we reach the Supreme Court luckily uh, we uh, we succeed every time uh, to convince the court that uh, uh, there is no basis, legal basis, uh, based on the factual background uh, to disqualify. But the, I think that the principle here is more important than the facts because the fact that you are conditioned and you are provisioned and each time you're kind of being threatened uh, to be disqualified if you support the Palestinian cause in this way or another, or that you have to be a very sweet, Arab, good Arab, that doesn't uh, uh, doesn't make a huge fuss or doesn't make a huge uh, difficulties for the uh, Jewish majority and has to come in the line with the uh, uh, with the politics of the uh, majority. This in self, this in and of itself, puts the Palestinians in general and their political representatives in a manner that they uh, uh, want, that, that, that the government wants them to feel that you are not in the parliament because you have the right to do so, but you are there because you, we gave you the favor uh, uh, to be in the parliament. Now, um, at some point as well, um, okay, wow, two minutes. Uh, at some point as well, uh, uh, in 2003, uh, the citizenship law uh, 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 basically was passed to uh, uh, to prohibit the entry of Palestinians as well as residents from Arab states that are defined by the Israeli law as enemy states to enter to Israel for the purpose of family unification. This law viewed sweepingly all Palestinians from the West Bank, Gaza, and Arab states as an immediate threat to the security of the state of Israel, um, uh, which basically means that they are not allowed to have family unification. So if I'm living in Haifa and I wanna marry someone from Ramallah, for example, I'm not allowed to bring my spouse or my children from the West Bank and live together with me inside of a Haifa. But this, in its, this law itself is also one of the most dangerous laws because it doesn't look on the individual application of the family unification. It looks at the mere fact of your national and ethnic affiliation 
uh, to come and say that you are not allowed to enter because you are the enemy, exactly the same policy that the Americans uh, uh, implemented against uh, uh, Americans from Japanese descent uh, during World War II after the uh, uh, Pearl Harbor uh, uh, attack. And at some point in July in 2018, we reach the Jewish nation state law, which comes in a basic law, which has a constitutional uh, a status. It comes and says clearly that the state of Israel is the state of the Jewish people. The right to self-determination is exclusively given only to the Jewish uh, people. The official language of uh, the state of Israel is Hebrew and Arabic doesn't have anymore an official status. The state is allowed yeah, I, I, I got it, but just I want to uh, uh, complete the, uh, in, in uh, one or two sentences. And uh, uh, one of the articles of this Jewish nation state law uh, is basically uh, the, uh, uh, the right of the uh, state given to it by this basic law to establish Jewish only towns, which will have a huge effect as well on establishing settlements in the West Bank uh, uh, and making the, dif making the challenging uh, of the establishment of settlements more difficult because this basic law uh, will give and gives constitutional legitimacy for establishing Jewish only towns or Jewish only settlements in the West Bank. Now, um, uh, I didn't get to a lot of things that I wanted, so I'll leave that to the Q's and A's, including the Trump plan, so I'll keep you waiting for the answer for it and, and enable you as well to, to, to ask. That was an absolutely excellent presentation. I think people listening to that will appreciate the general context. And I think Salson spelt that out excellently in terms of the general problem. Um, just a word of explanation, if I may, for people who are perhaps new to the issue of Palestine. Sometimes Palestinians talk about 48 Palestine, or they talk about Palestine in the green line. And that means exactly the same as Palestinians who live in Israel. Uh, but just some people may not be familiar with the, the different terms that are used. Some years ago, I had the honor and pleasure of going with a trade union delegation uh, on a visit to, to Palestine and part of that was visiting the uh, Nakab, the Negev desert and to visit uh, Bedouins who at that time were under threat from a plan called the Prower Plan which meant to create bantustans in which they were going to be forced to live. One of the villages that we uh, went to was called Al Arakib uh, and that village was raided when we were there, this is four or five years ago now, it had been already been raided something like 113 times, I think it's now over 200 times that has been raided. And yet this is a village that was in establishment since the days of prior to, to Balfour. In fact, they had a cemetery at the entry to the village, which had gravestones, which were dated 1913. And yet uh, the Israeli government was seeking to move them from that. So it's a very important part of the discussion about Palestinians inside Israel that we have an opportunity to hear our next speaker, Amir Abu Queda, who's a political activist uh, and campaigner, uh, who's involved in Azamud village, where he is from as part of the local committee. So we're very pleased to welcome you, Amir. I'm glad to be with you and I'm really delighted to share with you uh, uh, some of the realities of what's happening in the Nakab uh, and in, in the unrecognized communities in general. So just maybe a few words about myself. I, I'm involved in the local committee as a speaker. I'm also activist and uh, a representative of the NCF, the Negev Coexistence Forum for Civil Equality which was established in the early 90s, in the late 90s, to, pro to provide a place for Arab-Jewish collaborative efforts in the struggle for civil equality and the advancement of shared society, mutual tolerance, and coexistence in the Nakab. So uh, the, the Bedouin Arabs are an indigenous people like uh, other Palestinians, most of whom internally displaced from, la from lands they had owned for centuries. From the early 50s on, the Bedouins Arabs were dispossessed from their lands by means of flows passed by the Israeli Knesset parliament and, the Isra and uh, other legal mechanisms and varied administrative measures also. Nowadays, we have more than 300,000 uh, Bedouins living in the, in the Nakab, and they are actually living in the most disadvantaged uh, communities in Israel and are struggling for their rights of land ownership, equality, recognition, 
and the pursuit of their distinctive way of life. Uh, about 60% of the Bedouin Arab citizens live in seven failing government planned towns, and the remainder live in dozens of villages that are not recognized by the government, as well as in several newly recognized townships. Uh, Obviously, the Arabs in the uh, in the unrecognized community they don't uh, receive any basic services such as running water, electricity, uh, paved roads, proper edu education, health, and welfare services. In addition, they live under the continuous threat of harm demolitions, crop destruction, and further displacement. Uh, I would like to uh, address a um, very important issue about uh, the so-called um, uh, cultural uh, distinction of Bedouins, the, the other Palestinians. Bedouins are actually, are often presented as and perceived both by Jews and Arabs alike as a group of uh, loyal and obe uh, obedient citizens of the states. <coughs> it's, I mean, this, uh, this perception or this portrayal of, our, of the Bedouin citizens is actually, um, is actually meant to create a chiasm between them and other, uh, their fellow Palestinian, um, their fellow Palestinian um, brothers and sisters. Uh, but historically, the, historically the, Pal the Bedouins were actually um, um, very much a in connection with neighboring Palestinian communities and we're part and partial from the, the, the overall Palestinian population. And historically Gaza uh, was actually the capital of the, of the Nakab and the vast majority of Palestinians um, lived actually in this, in this region. So maybe some historical background uh, on the eve of the inception of Israel, about more than 100,000 Palestinians lived in the Nakab area. Uh, they were concentrated in a restricted geographical area of, of approximately 1,000 square kilometer in the eastern, less fertile Nakab uh, region, which is called the Siyaj area. And uh, they were actually prohibited from uh, moving uh, to, to, to other places and their more fertile land was actually turned over to the Jewish settlements in the in this uh, in this region. Uh, nowadays, the major threats our community faces actually are home demolitions. We have more than two thousand home demolitions annually in in the unrecognized communities. I mean. Israel is a pretty much very planned uh, place, and every Arab, um, I mean, in, in the unrecognized community, you can't issue a building permit for your house because there is no any master plan. Those communities, despite the fact that they were actually existent, existed before the establishment of Israel, uh, their, uh, their status was never actually um, a knowledge as, uh, as villages. Uh, and they were actually, I wouldn't say neglected because it's, I think it was purpose, purposefully done. Um, uh, and uh, the continuing home demolitions are taking place. I mean, just uh, yesterday, um, uh, destruction warrants were actually uh, given in my in my in a Zarnuk village, and this is this intimidation of people with uh, uh, and the destruction of homes is a very effective uh, method, unfortunately, to intimidate our community. Um, and also, um, and this so-called forced urbanization process. I mean, the Arab. Bedouins are actually rural communities which were displaced, concentrated, uh, and so in government townships, um, in order to, um, in order for the Zionist movement to overtake their lands, and 
I wouldn't even say forced urbanization because it's not really urban, urbanization because those townships lack any basic, um, I mean, uh, no industrial zones, um, no any technological hubs nowadays, uh, just uh, um, dormitories to sleep in and to leave in the early morning. So, uh, so, the home demolition policy, evictions of villages, you mentioned Al Arakib. We recently had the case of Amm al Hiran, which, Asli, which was a very prominent case where actually an Arab village was, uh, was evicted and newly built Jewish community settlers from the West, uh, from the West Bank were actually uh, relocated into their into their um, location and we and we see this increased tendency and this escalation of policies uh, against the bedouin community and just recently uh, uh just uh, in the recent two weeks we witnessed uh, uh, increased incitement uh, from the from uh, the Israeli political uh, party of Yamina, for example, they had a tour in the Nakab. Uh, one of the Israeli um, um, MKs, uh, Smotrich, uh, actually was inciting against the Arab Bedouin, saying that their the birth rates in the Arab communities are actually um, a, a, a bomb. Uh, despite the, the fact that he has seven children and the birth rate of the settlers are actually nowadays the, the much higher than, um, the, than uh, Arab Bedouins. And also we witnessed uh, the police raiding the village of, uh, uh, the village of Bir Haddad a few days ago, um, uh, arresting um, arresting a lot of people in this in this community, and this police brutality, police uh, against the Arab Bedouins, we witness it uh, not just in raiding and uh, demolishing houses, but also in the persecution of human rights defender like Sheikh Sayyah, who was actually um, who was jailed and imprisoned uh, um, more than once. Uh, because of his str struggle and his uh, resistance in, in Al Arakib, and for Sheikh Sayyah, has becoming a symbol uh, of the Bedouin uh, struggle. Uh, I would also just uh, uh, say a few things about the development induced displacement. Israel always used development as pretext of displacement. So the, the we can talk about the Ramat Beka industrial zone where the Israel actually planning military compounds and uh, um, uh, uprooting Arab Bedouin communities from this region. Uh, we have the extension of the Israeli highway uh, where more than, more than 5,000 of, uh, of Bedouins are actually in danger of um, displacement. Uh, we have the railways. Israeli uh, ra railways are, um, uh, are getting to the Nakab area, and uh, in some accidental way, all this development is just happening above the Arab Bedouin community, and it's it's perceived and seen as measure actually to dispossess the Arab community. So development is there and the legal mechanisms are there. And uh, in order actually to strip Arabs uh, their lands. Uh, a very important uh, issue also, the greenwashing uh, policies of the Israel, of the Kakal, the JNF, the uh, Jewish National uh, uh, Fund, which uh, actually campaigning abroad for fighting desertification and um, uh, raising a lot of money, uh, raising a lot of money abroad, uh, but we witnessed in Al Arakib and in Amm Al Hiran that those trees that were actually implanted, they were implanted in order 
to uh, dispossess the Arab communities who are living there. And we witness it all along the, the, the Palestinian uh, um, geography that Kakal and uh, their greenwashing policies are actually meant to, um, um, to dispossess Arabs from their, uh, from their lands. Uh, a very important um, issue also, the so-called the Bedouin Authority. The policy of the state towards its Bedouin citizens is reflected not only in the demolition of homes and disposition of land, but also in that it does not treat the Bedouin population as citizens of equal status. One of the key manifestations of this is that unlike other Israeli citizens, the relationship between Bedouin residents and the state systems and authorities is mediated by unique institutions established by the state just for this purpose. Unlike most of the country, Bedouin citizens in the Nakab do not have fully independent local government institution. And in the unrecognized villages, there are no such formal institutions. So in a nutshell, development in the Nakab is happening in order to dispossess Arabs. Israel created legal mechanisms, administrative measures to uh, uh, dispossess uproot Arab community. But in the very 50 seconds I have, the Arab Bedouin communities is resilient, is strong. The, the Israel uh, once thought that it will relocate all Arab Bedou Bedouins into one, um, uh, one government plan townships in the, in the late 70s. But the reality nowadays is that we have more than uh, in 20 recognized communities and with the struggle of the NCF, um, the uh, RCUV, Regional Council for Unrecognized Villages, uh, Adela and other civil society actors and our community itself, uh, people, are, uh, people are resilient uh, despite all the policies uh, we have. And um, Bedouins are really stubborn. Yeah, I mean, we live in very harsh conditions and uh, uh, the Israelis will not really um, yeah, I mean, matter much in, in this case. We will uh, continue to be resilient. Our last of the three speakers is Omar Shakir. Omar is the Israel and Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch, as everyone knows, I think is a very important international body concerned with, with human rights. It is well respected uh, and he has been working on the situation of the human rights abuses in Israel. So, Omar, you're very welcome. Thank you, uh, Bernard, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining into the Palestine Solidarity uh, Campaign for the invitation. It's a real honor to speak with Sosan, who's really one of the leading uh, activists and authorities uh, on these issues, and with Amir, who you know is doing such painstaking work on the ground uh, in the area really uh, inside Israel most uh, affected by the institutional discrimination policies that have been laid out. What I want to do um, in my presentation presentation is to really focus on issues around land. Uh, we put out a report on these issues last month, which goes into it into more depth uh, and to really build on what Sosin laid out. And I think in many ways that conversation is very timely because so much of the discussion now about Israel-Palestine is focused on annexation and what it might mean even though there's a paucity of information about what arrangements might be put in place. Um, and not only is that conversation disconnected from the reality on the ground, where Israel already controls uh, the entire area from uh, the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, but strangely, it's so disconnected from areas Israel already has declared sovereignty over um, in the situation for Palestinians there, namely uh, Israel, uh, inside Israel proper, um, and East Jerusalem. So I think Sosan started the right way by talking about history, and certainly with land, you have to start there. But what you end up seeing when you look at Israeli policy on both sides of the green line is that Palestinians are restricted to dense population centers while maximizing the land available for Jewish communities. Inside Israel, Palestinians lost millions of dunams of land um, in the events following 1948. Um, one historian puts the figure at 4.5 million dunams and uh, found that 350 of the 370 
Jewish communities built between 1949 and 1953 were built on land confiscated from Palestinians. Much of that confiscation took place between 1949 and 1966, when Palestinians were put into enclaves and uh, could only move between those enclaves with permits issued by the Israeli army. And the Israeli newspaper Haaretz reported in 2019 that um, looking at declassified government documents that the government only ended military rule over Palestinians in 66 once they were assured that Palestinians wouldn't return, that were internally displaced, wouldn't return to the villages they came from. Um, uh, and, uh, there are two mechanisms primarily used by Israeli authorities to take land following 1948. The first, as Sosin mentioned, was the absentee property law, which basically said that um, if you were not um, on your land uh, uh, after, uh, you know, on, in 1947 in November, um, then you lost access to that land and went to a custodian uh, that, that took control of that land and eventually became state land. Another mechanism that was used was to declare the area where Palestinian villages stood as closed military zones, and then eventually to um, take ownership over those lands. Adala actually has estimated that about 1.2 to 1.3 million dunams of land was taken via the second mechanism, or about 40% of the land that Palestinians had owned. Um, just to make the point clear, this isn't some you know, issue that's dead that took place years ago. We have Supreme Court cases as recently as the early 2000s in which internally displaced Palestinians are continuing to insist on their ability to live in the areas or the villages where they came from. Just to bring this to the current time, that confiscated land became state land. And as Sosin mentioned, 93% of all land today inside Israel is state land. Just to give you a perspective on what that means, nearly half the seats of the government body that allocates state lands belong to the Jewish National Fund, which is a group that has a mandate um, to develop lands for Jewish communities and nobody else. And they directly own 13% um, of um, the land throughout um, Israel. And they've made clear in court that they are not obligated to... Um, to everybody, they're obligated only to Jewish communities. In 2003, a state commission actually found that expropriation activities undertaken were done for the purpose of serving the interest of the Jewish majority. So in essence, you have 93% of the land inside Israel that effectively are being used to serve the Jewish community and not all the citizens, as Sosin mentioned, 21% of whom are actually um, Palestinian. Um, Israel has explicit policies in areas like um, the Galilee or the Negev, areas that are, you know, make up about two thirds of the uh, of, of the population of of Palestinians to Judaize these areas. These are state policies on the books that use the term Judaizing for these areas. Since 1948. The Israeli government has established over 900 Jewish localities, but none for Palestinians outside of a handful, and, and uh, Amir referenced this, of government-planned townships largely to concentrate dispersed Bedouin communities. So again, think about that. 72 years and Palestinians are largely living in the same communities that existed uh, 72 years ago, no sort of new expansions. But it's actually much worse than even that because most of, um, uh, because the two elements, first of all, the Jewish communities that were built, most of them actually restrict who can live there. So Israel has formal admissions committees um, that Adala has found applies to about 43%. Um, of all towns and villages across the country, in which, by law, these towns can restrict people from living there who are, quote, not suitable for the social life of the community or who are, quote, or are incompatible with the social and cultural fabric uh, of the community. Uh, one professor, Yusuf Jabarin, of the Technion University in Haifa, found that there are more than 900 small Jewish towns that restrict who can live there and have zero Palestinians living among them. 900 towns and villages with zero Palestinians living there who restrict who can live there. So 21% about of the population is Palestinian citizens of Israel, according to the latest data from the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics. Of this number, um, only uh, about 90% 
live in Palestinian towns and villages. And those Palestinian towns and villages control about 3%, not even control, they are on about 3% of the land of the state. So take a step back. Palestinians haven't had new towns and villages built since 1948. They largely live in the same ones. And those villages are about 3% you know, of the entire territory of the land. So not only do they live in the same villages as 1948, but those villages have shrunk in, in, in many cases since 1948. Or those that have grown have not grown commiserate with population growth. And our research that we published last month goes through the different mechanisms used um, by uh, um, planning processes to restrict growth. So for example, um, you've heard from um, uh, Amir quite a bit about the South. Human Rights Watch has done studies in each of uh, Israel's six districts to show that this is the case. Let me give you a few examples of research that we published uh, earlier this month. There's the Palestinian uh, uh, town of Jisra Zarqa, it's the only Palestinian town um, on the Mediterranean inside Israel. That town, um, it has a population density 30 times um, that of the neighboring uh, Jewish kibbutz of Magan Makieli. The town is basically boxed in. To its south, you have the uh, predominantly Jewish uh, community of, of Kisaria, which Netanyahu comes from. They actually built a sand wall to separate Jisr al-Zarqa from Kisaria. To the east, uh, Israeli authorities, when under the military rule of Palestinians, built a highway that separates just as Zarqa from lands that residents once owned to the east. And to the north, you have fish ponds belonging to the kibbutz of Magan Makieli. So you have, in essence, 15,000 people jammed into an area of about um, 1,500 dunams, um, so about 1.5 square kilometers. Um, so that's one example that we looked at in our recent studies. We also looked at a area in the central district called Qalensua, a Palestinian town which um, is actually largely barred from building on about half the land in the town. Those areas have either been classified as green areas um, where building is prohibited or agricultural zones where you're not allowed to build homes uh, despite having a, a housing crunch there. Meanwhile, right next door, you have a Jewish community which has an admissions committee of Sha'ar Afraim, um, which has none of these uh, challenges facing uh, Qalansua. And then uh, uh, another example we looked at was Ain Mahal. Ain Mahal is a Palestinian village which is um, near Nazareth, which is basically encircled by Nazareth elite, now known as Nuf Hagalil, which is a predominantly Jewish city built in the 1950s based on the admission of Israeli authorities to swallow up and divide Palestinian communities in the area. And not only is Ain Mahal an island within this locality, but it can't use the majority of its land because they've been zoned uh, for agricultural uh, purposes or as green areas. So these are just case studies that you'll find um, you know, in our report that uh, a link will be made available to you. So I think you know, part of the point here is to sort of underscore uh, taking a step back, that efforts to end Israel's discriminatory rule will fall short so long as they overlook the, the, the situation of Palestinian citizens of Israel. And land is important not only because it's so central to the everyday experience. It leads to overcrowding, population density. Um, you know, the Arab Center for Alternative Planning estimates that, um, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the homes in Palestinian uh, communities uh, do not have permits and that, uh, you know, uh, about 60,000 or, or even more homes are at risk of demolition. But land also seeps into other areas, including uh, discrimination of municipal budgets. So to give you one example um, of how this seeps into other areas, um, because of the limited land that um, Palestinian municipalities have, um, there's a gap in the amount of um, tax revenues they receive, not only residential taxes, but even more the taxes they receive from businesses, from governments, uh, et cetera. The Israeli human rights group Sukui found that Jewish towns and villages receive 6.5 times the tax revenues from um, from businesses, from governments, and that's not a coincidence. 2.76%, um, less than 3% of government-run industrial zones are located um, in Palestinian municipalities, less than 3% of all industrial zones created by the government. There are also, according to Sukui, no government uh, buildings, army bases, hospitals, universities, government administrative offices in Palestinian municipalities. These buildings generate tax revenue. Um, two minutes. Uh, 
so just to give you a perspective of what that means, um, in, in April, and, and I think Sosin referred to this, uh, the Israeli government provided relief uh, for, for, for corona for local municipalities. Only 2.2% of that relief, actually, this is according to the Knesset Research Center, went to Palestinian municipalities. And the reason was that it was based on a calculation uh, and part of tax revenue received. Uh, and Adela has been challenging that, and so I'm sure can say more in questions. Um, and the final thing I want to say is um, many people will justify this discrimination or overlook it um, by saying, well, Palestinians are citizens, right? They vote in the Knesset and, and they have significant power um, uh, because of that. They're not, you know, uh, but, but it, it's a bit deceptive. I think Sosin referred to this, the nation state law. Um, and I think it's important just to end by saying, yes, Palestinians are citizens, but Israel has a two track citizenship process where Jews um, have the ability to become automatic citizenships by virtue of being Jewish, whereas Palestinians only are able to obtain citizenship subject to a range of criteria, including being present uh, before 47, uh, between 48 and 52 or afterwards, or by virtue of being born there. So today you have 5.5 million plus Palestinian refugees who aren't able to return to their homes under a same law that will allow a Jewish American or European to go back there. So even though they're citizenships, it's under a separate track that gives them an inferior status by law. And the second track is what Sosa mentioned, that although they're citizens, they actually have a different nationality than Jewish Israelis. Jew is a nation, Arab is a nation, and that discrimination pervades other areas. Um, I'll stop there. I see the link to our report's been made uh, in the chat, but I think the bottom line here is, you know, any analysis um, that focuses on combating discrimination without dealing with Palestinian citizens, frankly, is only a partial picture uh, that fails to, to, to really get at what's at the root problem here, which is Israel's discriminatory rule over Palestinians, regardless of where they live. Omar, thank you very much indeed. I, I think our speakers have all complemented each other excellently, going from the big picture that Sasson painted from the outset, focusing down onto the particular situation facing the Bedouin in the Nakab, and Omar's uh, description of some of the ways in which land is stolen and Palestinians are denied access to the land. The first question uh, I, I want to raise is perhaps uh, not exclusively, but Sasson, this is something you, you might want to pick up, and that is a question about the legal definition of a apartheid, uh, whether uh, it's something that does correspond to the actual situation uh, in Israel. Uh, is it applicable? Uh, is that terminology appropriate? Do you consider it appropriate? But it's not exclusively to Sousen, so Omar and Amir, please please comment too, but uh, it, I, I, I'll start with Sousen. Yeah, thank you. I, this, this The question is very important, relevant and actual because we are uh, these days like, you know, Palestinians in Israel together as well with uh, allies uh, all over, we're discussing uh, all the applicability of the definition of apartheid. However, uh, we don't think, like I also don't think that uh, it's necessary to talk about what the definition of apartheid and say whether it is applicable or not, but to talk about it in a more general terms and check whether the regime, the Israeli regime and the Israeli legal system uh, and the institution itself uh, basically uh, exercise uh, apartheid uh, in terms of systematic uh, and institutionalized discrimination against Palestinians as a minority in a systematic way, whether through policies, whether through laws, and whether through all means. When we have something like the Jewish nation state basic law as a constitution which set the superiority and supremacy of the Jews uh, 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 inside of Israel, uh, this already means that you have uh, one group who is more superior than uh, the other. Uh, in the petition that we submitted uh, uh, against, uh, we submitted a, a petition against the Jewish nation state law to the Israeli Supreme Court. It's still pending and it might be heard for the first uh, hearing uh, maybe towards November, December. And we clearly said that 
uh, we cannot uh, continue talking about mere discrimination against Palestinians because having the Jewish nation state law sets, which sets the supremacy of the uh, uh, Jewish citizens uh, over all other uh, uh, groups, including and mostly, of course, the Palestinian uh, uh, minority who are native or homeland minority. They're not a regular minority. They are a homeland minority basically sets the basis for a regime that we should call a colonial regime with future characteristics of apartheid. This means that it's a little bit difficult uh, uh, to come and say uh, you have clearly the crime of apartheid uh, set in. Uh, you also need to check it based on criteria of what's happening in the 48 and what's happening in the 67. But on the other hand, uh, the colonial, the, the, the definition that we already uh, supported in our legal arguments based on factual arguments and legal, putting a legal basis to it is a regime, not necessarily a definition, again, not necessarily goes to the crime of apartheid as a definition, but a regime that constitutes a colonial regime with future characteristics of apartheid. However, I don't think that this is what matters, the definition. What matters is the rights discourse. Are you talking about, because when you're talking about apartheid or colonialism, it of course leads to talking about one state, two states, three states, or a number of states. And when you're talking about uh, the system in, in, in Israel, which also applies in, on 1967, it's important to analyze it from an analysis of a rights discourse, especially that that focuses or that examines the right of the self-determination of the Palestinians in 1948 and in 1967. So I also want to put this challenge as well here, and if I have the ability later, I can um, expand more. Salsan, thank you. I just wondered, uh, Amir, if you'd like to respond to the question, perhaps uh, from the perspective, as you were describing earlier, about the situation of the Bedouin, perhaps, but also uh, more generally about how you view that question. I think, I mean, if we look at the, at the reality in the knock-up and also in, in, first of all, I would like to commend the fact that the, the idea of uh, uh, Arab minority in Israel, okay, the, the minority is actually uh, uh, a, something that has been generated by, by, uh, by, by Israel and maintained with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the separation of the West Bank and uh, with the West Bank, Gaza. Uh, uh, so actually we are, we are, Palestinians are the majority in the historical Palestine in general. And we talk about the Palestinian uh, citizens of, of Israel. So my minority is something that has, that has been created uh, uh, with uh, uh, a lot of different practices. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so going back to your question about uh, about the apartheid uh, uh, regime, I mean the reality we live in is is very familiar with apartheid. What I perceive when when Abu Hiran is being demolished and other uh, Jewish community is being established, or uh, <coughs> or in in in, uh, in other cases and manifestations, so. Okay, maybe the, the legal framework is not exactly the same. Maybe people would like to theorize about it much, but what people actually perceive is 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 uh, very uh, very uh, remnant uh, of of uh, apartheid. I think it's uh, it would be um, a matter of uh, w would it be would it be uh, advantageous for us. To, uh, to, to take this uh, stand and, and, and work with it. But the reality on the ground is, is, is more even than, than apartheid in a lot of terms. I mean, 
Okay, thank you. And then Omar? Um, sure. I, I, you know, I, I'll leave time for other questions. I'll just add uh, to what Sosin has said to say that you know, apartheid um, is a legal term. Um, it's, it's defined in its own convention. The Convention on the Crime of Apartheid is also defined uh, in the Rome Statute, the ICC. I think people use the term sometimes without you know, saying if they mean like South Africa. Because although used originally with South Africa, it's now a legal term. It's a crime like other crimes are there. Um, and I think Sosin hit the nail on the head. It's a crime that, um, you know, if you study it, that has several elements. But it's about um, a policy where a government commits certain inhumane acts uh, or serious violations um, uh, in the context of what's termed systematic oppression and domination by one group over the other with intent to maintain that group. So it's a legal definition. And I think the question of whether or not um, Palestinian citizens or Israel fit in, um, I think the definition of the crime would be that if, you know, depending on how you make that determination, you would look at Palestinians, you know, as a, a people um, compared to Jewish Israelis as a group, and you would have to study, um, you know, the definition, apply the facts to it, and that's certainly something that I think many groups um, are, are looking at. Thank you very much, Omar. Uh, so this is a bit um, slightly different question, perhaps, but I think it's a, a very interesting one, and that is, what is your views about the joint list, the uh, joint list put forward by uh, parties which are generally presumed to be Arab parties, uh, but include people like uh, Balad, as it was called, um, Hadash, uh, and, and uh, so on. Uh, what do you think the perspectives are for it? Do you think it has the possibility of becoming a, a major opposition within the Knesset? Do you think it has a op potential for um, you know, playing any kind of important role in terms of uh, the sorts of issues that we've been talking about. And I'm, so I'll, I'll take Omar first. Sure, and I probably have the least to say. I'll defer to my Palestinian colleagues, especially uh, Sosan, who, who does so much legal work, uh, you know, with, with defending the right of, uh, you know, Palestinian citizens of Israel to sit in the Knesset every day. Um, you know, look, what, what, what I can say is, um, I think Sosan laid out some of the laws that exist. In essence, you, can, you can't, in the Knesset, challenge the Jewish and democratic nature of the state, um, which is a major, it, it, it basically means Palestinians can't challenge their subjugation by law. At the same time, um, I think it's a mistake to, to say, and I, let me also add that no government in Israel's history has ever included Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, at the, you know, the, the Rabin government, they were sort of supporting from the outside. But at the same time, I think it's a mistake to just, uh, you know, say it's a meaningless, uh, you know, right, because I think, uh, you know, uh, parliamentarians do play uh, a role in, in advancing the interests of Palestinian citizens of Israel. They've been involved uh, principally in pushing for um, not only uh, changes inside Israel for communities, issues of crime, domestic violence. I mean, after all, um, you know, Palestinian citizens of Israel, like every other citizen, want to live in safety, you know, want to have access to good schools. And so they play a critical role um, in, in a government that other, otherwise considers them uh, second, third class citizens and advocating, you know, for their rights. And I think uh, it's beyond my expertise as a human rights lawyer to tell you whether or not they've been successful. But I think just to erase them is, 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 is a mistake, um, you know, but, but to also acknowledge that they are fighting in a system um, that is built to maintain the domination um, of Jewish Israelis. So they're in, inherently fighting in an, in, in an unjust system, um, subject to unfair rules. So um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Omar. Amir, would you like to respond? Uh, I also worked in the joint list as advisor of one of the, of the members of the Knesset, and I definitely think that uh, the, 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 the Israeli parliament I mean, we have a lot of domestic issues, and if we leave them to the to the others, uh, we won't have you know Palestinian leadership who will uh, who who will rise, but more uh, people who will uh, collaborate with the Israeli establishment, uh, the uh, Palestinian identity where we worked so long to uh, uh, to maintain will uh, will be eradicated in a way. So we need this political leadership. I mean, uh, be it in, in the Israeli parliament, as long as we can't really have an, a, an independent um, representative um, forum for our, for our uh, uh, the Palestinian minority living in Israel. And we witnessed also the, the uh, for example, uh, uh, 
bringing the Islamic movement out of the out of the Israeli law and uh, uh, actually narrowing the uh, narrowing the so-called democratic space within within Israel. So nowadays, parties like uh, Balad, for example, is is consistently uh, being pressured from from uh, from uh, from Israel and uh, <coughs> so. Uh, I think that the joint list, and we also witnessed um, um, tremendous increase in the in the voting for the joint list in the last Israel, Israel election. In a sense, of the Arab citizens uh, actually uh, demanding uh, or actually responding to the to the incitement of the Israeli politicians against the Arab minority. So. Uh, it's very, very crucial, uh, and I think they are doing great job. Despite, I mean, despite the the problematic that we are actually also sometimes used as as uh, um, as uh, a cover for the Israeli democracy in some in somehow, but uh, we don't have much options to be honest. I mean, if you look in the in the in the, in the region and other neighboring countries. We are on our on owns, and somehow, I mean, we have a lot of people. It's, it's, I mean, uh, in solidarity with us, but we have to create our political leader, leadership and work with what we have, and not what we wish uh, uh, to have. Thank you very much, uh, and Sausan. Uh, well, yeah, each question here needs a whole uh, webinar, uh, so uh, I'll try to do that very briefly. So. Um, First of all, the joint list comprised from three politi Arab political parties, different in their political uh, uh, theme, a, a political uh, um, uh, um, program. Yes, exactly, a platform. Uh, this means that they already are able uh, to represent a big diverse of. Uh, political uh, uh, perspectives among the Palestinians. Uh, however, on the other hand, and the fact is that the majority of the Palestinians in the last uh, at least two elections, and in the last year we had three elections uh, in between April 2019 until March 2020, and uh, the majority of the Palestinians who did vote voted for the joint list. Of course, there is a portion of the Palestinian citizens who don't vote for the joint list, mainly because they believe in boycotting the legal system because it's not effective, because it's Israel uh, defined as Jewish and democratic, because it's colonial, because, you know, for, for different reasons. So there are those who don't vote out of ideological uh, a, 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 a reasons, and some of them out of just, you know, they don't want to vote. Uh, and there are those who uh, vote for the joint uh, uh, list. Now, the fact that you have uh, today a uh, representation of uh, 15 seats to the joint list among 120 says a lot. In spite of, despite the fact that they will never be part of the Israeli government coalition because they never were asked even since 1948, despite the fact that they will not be able to really make uh, effective, uh, have an effective voice uh, because they are not the majority and they only have 15 seats. But the fact is that today we have the highest number of seats that go to Arab political uh, parties uh, under the a frame of the joint list is a huge achievement. Uh, this is the first time in the last election of March 2020 where the joint list or the Arab political parties reached 15 seats in the parliament. Now, again, we know that we will not have effective uh, representation, uh, effective political participation, because we cannot forget as well that the legal framework of those members of the parliament is limited within the framework of the, defin of the <coughs> definition of state as a Jewish and democratic state. They cannot submit laws that 
negate the Jewishness of the state. And there was one example uh, three, four years ago of member of Knesset Ahmed Tibi who submitted a bill that basically wants the recognition of the Nakba. And this bill, not only it was not submitted in the Knesset, it was prohibited even to be submitted. And we, we petitioned, we challenged that in court. So the legal framework of their work is very limited. Uh, but however, I think that even though, uh, again, the effective political representation is very restricted and they will never be, the fact as well that the last two, mainly the last two uh, elections in September 2019 and in March 2020, uh, 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 the, 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 the presence of the joint list in the parliament with a very significant number of seats uh, uh, led to a coalition a crisis that uh, we can say that it was one of the things that uh, uh, contributed uh, to the failure of having to form a government led by Netanyahu in September, which led to the third election in March 2020. We only have to wait and see what, uh, uh, what will the uh, efficiency, uh, if I can put it this way, be in the coming government of having the opposition, uh, the joint list as opposition in the parliament. Thank you very much indeed, Sals. And I think, I think this whole question of the, of the joint list and what it is capable of doing does in itself, as you said, merit a, a webinar to discuss uh, how it, how it can, what role it can play. Clearly, it's not going to be in a parliamentary position to win majorities in the Knesset, but it can act as uh, people used to say in the past, as a tribune for the people, speaking out for the people about what is happening, not only for the Palestinians of 48, uh, but also for the Palestinians in the occupied territory as well. And um, as a personal point of view, which I hope people will forgive me putting in, but I think uh, the potential and the role of the Palestinians in 48 is extremely important. And that's why as a campaign, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, has always said that we are in solidarity with all Palestinians, not just the Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, Gaza and East Jerusalem. Can I thank the three speakers for really excellent contributions. A pleasure to hear you uh, and our solidarity to all of you and to all our friends and comrades in Palestine. Uh, best wishes. Thank you very much indeed. You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Council. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ipsc.ie forward slash podcast. For more news, analysis, events and ways in which you can take action, see our website at www.ipsc.ie. Thank you for listening and you'll be hearing from us again soon.